beautiful day today. We came down early from, uh, from Tel Aviv, we drove through Jerusalem, and now we're in the area of the Dead Sea. And Jericho is like right over there, the Dead Sea is right over there, and Jerusalem is just from behind these hills, Bethlehem over that. So as you can tell, you know, we're in the Holy Land, we're in the land of the Bible. And why we're we here today? Because I want to draw your attention to a teaching that I think is, is it's missed by us uh, in the West because we don't understand uh, not just the original culture, but we don't understand uh, the language that we used. We rely on our translations that we have today in the 21st century, and most of them are really good. But every now and again, there's a word that's missed or somebody from the West chooses a word over the original one that was used, and it doesn't change the theology of, of the scripture, but it does take away or we lose some of, the, some of the meaning. So we don't see it in full color, and I'm hoping that we can bring the color back to this text today. Now, if I were to ask you, uh, what's the most famous scripture in the world? What, what would you say? If you're a Christian, um, an evangelical Christian, you'd probably say John 3.16, right? We all know that one, for God so loved the world. That's a very, very famous one. And then you can pick um, just, there's probably a bunch of other scriptures that different um, denominations and churches would use as kind of their slogan and their mantra for their ministry. But I want you to kind of zoom out a little bit and think of globally, whether you're, you're Jewish or you're Christian or kind of secular, what verse have you heard so often, but maybe you didn't even know it was in the Bible? It's most likely Psalm chapter 23. And if you've ever been to a funeral, you've heard it, right? Uh, for they lay though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and we, we've heard this. And it starts off with, with David saying, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. And as we were driving down here, you know, we drove by groves and droves of, of goats and sheep and lambs, and we saw shepherds everywhere in this region. And this is where King David spent a lot of his time when he was younger and he would be shepherding out in the fields. So we always think of David as King David, the, the great king, and he was. But long before he was that, he was a shepherd boy. And he would do it here in this part of, of the country. And Psalm 23 is later on in life and he's kind of reflecting. He's, he's looking back on all that God has done for him and he's, he's praising God. He's, he's reminding us of the highs and the lows and everything in between. In Psalm 23, he says, you know what, through it all, God's been my shepherd. He's the one who's been leading me. He's the one who's been with me. Despite all the good times and the bad times, all everything that I did wrong, everything I did right, I want you to think about David for a second. One of the most Im imperfect humans, just like you and I. But yet, at the end of his life, God says, you're a man after my own heart. And I don't know about you, but I want God to be able to say that about me. And Jerusalem, not too far from here, it's called the city of who? The city of David. The Messiah is known as the son of David. So David plays an integral role throughout biblical history. So why are we here in the wilderness? We could have shot this in an air-conditioned studio back home in North America. I could have shot it on a nice balcony where I'm staying, where it's nice and cool and green and I'd be in the shade. But we're here in the desert and we're, we're, we're coming down to one of the lowest points on the planet, just over here to the Dead Sea. So why did I want to show you this? I want to draw your attention to verse 3 in Psalm 23, where he talks about, he says that God would lead, lead me in his what? In his paths of righteousness. And what do you think of when you think of the word path? You're probably seeing something like a, like a straight, you know, narrow, long path. And then we come here and we begin to see some of the paths in the wilderness and we realize that we're actually missing something when you go back to the Hebrew. It's not even a word that was mistranslated or that was, you know, translated into a word that made more sense today in our culture. It's actually, it's missing completely from the text. And you might think it's not that big a deal. But it is a big deal. It totally gives whole new meaning to the text, and it's this. In English, in probably most other languages, it would say that God lead, leads us in the paths of righteousness. And then someone added what? In the straight paths of righteousness. Because when we think of a path, we want to walk down a straight path. We don't want to go to the left or the right. We just want to get there real quick. But if you go back to the Hebrew, it's very clear. David says, God, you lead me in your round paths of righteousness. Now, I want to park that for a second. And I want to show you something. Come with me. Now, I don't know how well we can pick this up or see it. No matter how great your cameras are, there's nothing like the good old human eyes to really see what's going on here. If you look into the side of the cliffs here, there's like these, 
looks to you like, like lines, kind of going like this from, from left to right. But they're actually not just lines, and maybe some people thought it could be from, from sediment, from you know, water levels rising and falling, and it would kind of you know, leave its mark and then leave its mark and leave its mark. But that's not it, it either. It's not a natural phenomenon, it's artificial. So how do we get it? Over hundreds, possibly over thousands of years, of shepherds bringing their goats out here into the wilderness, what happens is some, some of the better grass, you can see it, there's some bushes and some little things, they're at the top. There's some down here, but there's also some at the top, and the goats want to get up there, but this is way too steep. They can't just go straight up. They'll fall, they'll lose their footing, they'll break something, or maybe even die. So the only way that the goats can get to the top, and remember, David is watching this all of his life as a shepherd. The, the goats start to go around the mountain, and they slowly begin to make their way until they get to the very top. And the next one follows in behind that one, and the next one, the next one, and the next one. And over hundreds of years, over thousands of years, these goats have actually carved out these little tiny paths, these little tracks that go all the way around the hills, and they're all over. If I had a means to show you, I would take you up in the air and you could see it for, for miles and kilometers around. The hills are, are filled with these little paths. Now, why is that so important? You see, the goat can't take the shortcut. It can't go straight to the top because it's too, drain, too dangerous. The only way for it safely to get to the, to the nutrients, to the food that it needs to survive, is to take its time and to take it along these round paths of righteousness. And as David looks back on his life, he said, you know what? I could have taken the shortcut many times, and maybe I wanted God to take me the short way. But God always took me what we call the long way around, but it was the safe way, it was the best way, because eventually and ultimately we would get to where God wanted us to be. Okay, see what I'm doing here? I'm trying to find a way, <laughs> and I could just jump down, but it's a good little jump and I don't want to hurt myself, so what am I doing? I gotta take the long way around. I'm gonna cut my own path, like the goats used to cut, because I wanna do it safely and I wanna do it properly. Our human nature is we always want to take the shortcut, don't we? We want to get to the top. We want to get there as fast as we can. And when God doesn't answer in the way we want him to, we get upset with him. And we say, God, why don't you answer me right now? Follow me over here and I want to talk to you about why David looks back and gives us Psalm 23. Okay, so I'm gonna climb up here a little bit to try and give you guys a little bit of perspective. These, these hills, they're, they're huge. And everywhere I look, all I can see is these tiny little paths and I'm reminded of what David said. Now, some of you might be watching and saying, well, King David did take a shortcut. I mean, he was the king of Israel. He's the greatest king known in history and all this kind of stuff. But that's not how he started out. I want you to think about his life. When he was just a young boy and he was anointed by the prophet and he, and he, he waited, he, he bided his time. He, he, didn't, he didn't use violence, he didn't use force, he did it in God's timing. Let me give you an example. Not far from here is the Dead Sea. In fact, if we were to go five minutes down the road in the car, we'd be able to see the northern end of the Dead Sea already. And if you follow the, if you follow the sea kind of around and take the road, you end up in a place called En Gedi. And En Gedi, you can Google it, you can find it in scripture. And it, it's beautiful because it's an oasis right in the middle of the desert. And that's where God gives us the story of when uh, King David and his men, or he's not king yet, David is hiding in the cave with his men. And then Saul comes into the cave. And when he comes into the cave, David's men say, this is incredible. Look, God today has given your enemy into your hands. He's sleeping. All you gotta do there is kill him and you'll be the king. And David says, no, 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 I can't kill the king, but I want to send the message. 
And what he does is he goes down to where Saul is sleeping. And the Bible says that he cuts off the hem of his garment, which we know to be the tassels on the corner of the shawl that the king would have been wearing. And then later David shows it to Saul and says, listen, I'm not your enemy. Look, if I wanted to kill you, I could have, but this is not how God wants to do it. I'm not gonna take your life and force God's will on me and Israel. I'm gonna do it the right way. Instead of taking the shortcut and trying to climb to the top of that cliff, David said, I'm gonna take my time. I'm gonna let God do it in his own time. So how does this speak to us? What does this mean for us today? This is what's great about the Bible. You know, we read it. And yes, it's history. It tells us about things that happened here in this land hundreds and thousands of, of years ago. But it's more than just a historical record. There's actual lessons for us that we can learn that will really help us in our life. And this is one of, those, one of those beautiful ones where so often we just feel like, God, I've been praying for, for hours, for days, for months, for years, and you don't seem to be answering me. And we get frustrated with God and we say, why don't you just do it now? Look at what happened in the life of David. That's an example for us living today. You know, maybe, maybe you're watching this. I don't know if it's right after we've taped this or years and years later after we've taped it. But here's the beautiful thing about the Word of God. It's, it's got no shelf life. It doesn't go bad after a while. It doesn't expire. The principles in the Word are the same. And here's what I want to say to you, just as a, as a pastor, as a Christian, as a friend to those of you who are watching. Maybe you find yourselves in a season of waiting <laughs> and you're praying for someone. You're believing God for something. You're just, you're waiting on something. And you're saying, God, it's right there. Why can't I just have it now? When David saw the king, he could have said, look, he's right there. I can have him, but he waited. And maybe you're in that, in that season of waiting and you're frustrated. So whatever it is that you're believing God for, just keep walking that path. Keep walking that path. Don't be tempted to go off that route. Don't, don't listen to the lies or the distractions of this world and the enemy and try to, try to cut your own path because it's dangerous. And there's no net there. But when we walk in His, in his blessing, when we walk in His righteous paths. He's there to protect us. He's there to watch us. And He gives us these little, these little gentle nudges. He wants to make sure that we, that we stay on the path. You ever feel like you're doing this? I'm going to go over. And God says, I got you. You're walking. You're walking in my paths. Just keep walking. Keep believing. Keep waiting. And I know, because I've experienced it in my life, that at the right time, God will lead you. God will get you there. We're literally wandering through the wilderness just like the children of Israel did. And when God delivered them from bondage in Egypt, if you look at the map, you look at the route, and they were, they were up in the north near where present-day Cairo is, all they had to do was just go east and they could have cut across and, and just gone through the region that's Gaza today and they would have been in Jerusalem in, in no time. But instead, God took them all the way down. It seemed like, God, where are you leading us? Where did you take them? Why did you go such a long way around? There's a shortcut right there. Because there were Philistines. <laughs> there were giants. You see, the people didn't know it at the time. I'm sure they were grumbling, saying, God, why don't we go that way? We could have been there in no time. But God knows the end from the beginning. He knows and understands what's best for us. He knew what was best for the children of Israel then, and He knows what's best for you today. So don't get discouraged. Don't get frustrated, and don't give up. In 1992, God gave me a dream that one day I would go to Africa and help the poor the widow and the orphan, and I never saw it coming, and I tucked that away, and I waited, and I waited, and I just kept doing what God was, was, was working in my life, and I kept walking on the path He had put me on, and 27 years later, from 1992, God took me there, and now He's doing a beautiful and a special work. You see, if I had jumped ahead and done what I wanted to do when I thought I should have been done, maybe I would have missed it. So be encouraged today, and like those goats of old, Walk those paths of righteousness and you'll get there.